Right. Welcome to the Highland Heights Sunday morning Bible class. This is so serious, I'm going to take off my glasses for it. So, um, glad you're with us. Uh, glad you are joining our uh, Sunday morning Bible class uh, conversation. Um, we are in week three of our series on apologetics, uh, looking into uh, the reason why we believe. If you haven't uh, watch the, the previous two videos. I, I, I recommend taking the time to, to go back and and to uh, think about some of the, the issues that we've talked about so far. First week, we were, we were talking about why are we studying this in the first place. And then last week, we talked about the problem of pain and suffering. Um, this week, we are moving on to uh, a new topic having to do with uh, the historicity of the Bible, but more specifically, about miracles, uh, perhaps something that you might have heard before. Uh, usually, it would probably be a non-believer, uh, someone who, uh, who thinks that they, they know that the Bible can't be true because the Bible has miracles. And because the Bible has miracles included within the narrative of, of the Bible, they're, they're all throughout, uh, because of that, um, you can't trust what the Bible says. Uh, miracles aren't true, so therefore the Bible itself is not true, and therefore our faith is in vain. Um, we're going to look at this from several different angles, how we should handle it as Christians when someone approaches us with this uh, line of reasoning. Uh, but first, let's try to define a few things. So Jeremy, why don't you start us off? What's a miracle, and uh, what's really behind the question that we're answering here? But we use the word miracle so often, um, probably in recent history, the most uh, famous use of the word miracle was Al Michaels, uh, the uh, famous uh, U.S.-Soviet hockey game in 1980 and ended, do you believe in miracles? Yes. Uh, by the way, Al Michaels uh, famously said that if he would not have said that if it had occurred to him before it happened, um, that it was a spur of the moment thing. And so we, we tend to use miracles as just any unexpected or surprising or unlikely event, which is not what's going on in the Bible. Um, and the reason people have, and what you'll often hear skeptics say is that miracles are just the resort of foolish, ignorant people who lived in the past to explain things they couldn't explain. And we don't do that anymore because we, of course, are so enlightened and understand so much more and are so much smarter than any of the people that lived back then. And if you um, read my tone of voice, you can guess how, um, what I think about that sort of attitude, okay? Um, the people that lived back then were not foolish. They were not stupid. They, would, didn't, they might not necessarily have had all the knowledge we have, but they understood things about the way the world works. So, Jeremy, let me, let me insert here. Let me ask a question. So let's say I'm a skeptic. Okay. Yeah, I hear you saying this, and so I might respond with, uh, well, likely what you're going to tell me is that you believe what the Hebrew people wrote down, let's say the, the priests that recorded it in 500 BC as they're putting together all of their scrolls, and you also believe uh, this collection of documents from 180, let's be generous there, um, and this collection, right? So you believe these two groups of people and their collection of stories that include miracles, but you don't believe um, the tales of uh, King Arthur. I, you know, I, I'm trying to think, you know, you don't believe the Egyptian uh, God of Ra. You don't believe of the, in these other stories of miracles uh, that are fr some from earlier in history and some from more recently in history. Uh, so why are these different? Well, I, that's that's a very good question, and it's something we need to consider because, look, we are claiming that things happened that don't normally happen and that we don't see happen today, okay? Let's, let's be honest and open about that, all right? We are, um, I'm hesitant to call them one-time events because there are some miracles that repeat, Um but these are unusual events that occur. These are things that occur outside of our normal experience, okay? And that, that's all true, and we need to acknowledge that. The difference is, and, and we'll get into more detail about this later, hopefully, but the difference is when you assess the historicity of these documents, 
okay? One of the most important things to remember is that this question misses something in the way it's phrased. The way it's often phrased is miracles contradict science, therefore they cannot be true. Well, we're not dealing with a question of science here. Um, and our culture puts a lot of, of emphasis on science with a capital S. The thing is that science is not the only source of truth. The scientific method can tell you a lot about the, about the physical world, but the scientific disciplines in and of themselves are different. You don't approach the study of biology, for example, the way you approach the study of physics um, or something like that. Okay, so you have these scientific disciplines. The scientific method is a source of truth, but it is not the source of truth. Okay, so when we're looking at these things, we need to remember that these are going to be outside the province of science. Okay, because what's happening is with these miraculous signs, and, and keep that word signs in mind because that's, that's important to remember. With these miraculous signs, God is interfering with the laws of nature. So they are, by definition, non-repeatable by human means. Okay? Mm -hmm. The scientific method requires a reproducible experiment or reproducible experimentation. We can't reproduce these things. Of course, the, the biggest miracles typically are things like resurrection from the dead. We can't do that. Um, and not, and by the way, we're not just talking about resuscitating someone on the operating table here. Sure. Um, Lazarus was in the tomb so long, his body had started to decay. That is beyond medical science. Okay. So the difference between the miracles we're claiming and the miracles, the, the, the incredible stories that come out of some of these other religious traditions is we are approaching this not from the method of, from the methodology of history. And so what you look at is, what are these stories, are these accounts, is this testimony historically reliable? So what we're dealing with is a question of history. Do miracles contradict science? Well, it's the suspension of scientific, of, it's the suspension of natural law. So it's not even really a question of science. It's a question of history. And what, what we're unpacking is, can you trust these accounts that we have in the Bible to tell us the truth. And why can you trust these over some of the other accounts that you deal, that you see out there in the religious world? Yeah. It, th there seems to be um, a, a problem of history to, to go along with what we're saying here is that um, this, so what, this is what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery, right? that we modern people believe uh, that uh, we are superior to people from hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, because we don't believe in magic. Uh, I've heard some engineers uh, that I like their products, but I've heard engineers say that uh, magic is something that, you know, science just hasn't caught up to yet. You know, what was a miracle a hundred years ago is taught in eighth grade science today. You know, that there's this progress of science and eventually all of our problems will be solved. Hmm. If we understand miracles in that way, then we have miscast what miracles are. And this kind of gets back to what you were saying, Jeremy, about answering the question, what's a miracle? Uh, it's not something that is improbable. It's something that is literally impot like. Not just like, oh, that's impossible. No, no, no. It cannot happen. It, it cannot happen in the natural world. Um, I think it's also appropriate here as we're, as we're talking about the, 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 uh, the Enlightenment age and the, uh, the marching, marching along of science is that we see this as a progression in, um, in worldviews as well. So for thousands of years, Christians and non-Christians had a broadly um, theistic worldview, viewing God at the center of the universe. God is in control of everything. And to, uh, well, in some ways, uh, at the Enlightenment, theism lived on, but also deism arose. And the deistic idea 
that yeah, God exists, but God, God is distant from us, that God is not actually involved in the universe at all. Um, most commonly, people will put, you know, Thomas Jefferson's of the world into the deistic camp. And so out of deism, or perhaps even alongside deism, arises the more atheistic tendency of what, it, what is called modernism. Uh, the idea that God probably doesn't exist or doesn't exist. And because of that, there is no way that the natural world and the supernatural or the, uh, the spiritual world can interact with each other if you acknowledge that the spiritual wor world exists. And so you can see kind of the linkages there between um, the theistic way of living and how if you go along through deism, uh, it's a hop, skip, and a jump over to modernism, uh, that if God is distant from us, then he, he can't operate in our world. So I, I say all of that to say that we Christians as theistic people, people that believe that God is still active in our world today, it's not difficult at all for us to believe that God can intervene into history and do something that is literally impossible, not improbable, but impossible uh, to, to raise someone from the dead or to create something from nothing. Um, perhaps uh, I think it's uh, fairly easy to say that the first miracle is creation itself. And so to, to say that, that God has power in this world is not, uh, is not difficult for us as Christians to um, to accept because we believe in an act of God. So it, it gets down to the worldview level and, and how that changes our beliefs and our actions that, that come out from there. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Um, the One of the challenges we face is people are ruling out a priori miraculous signs. Um, yeah. They're just, they say they don't happen now let's go look at your historical books. Okay, these books are not credible. Well, why not? Well, they have miraculous signs in them. Well, but these are credible miraculous signs because it's historically accurate. No, it's not. Why not? Because it has miracles and we know miracles don't happen. And so you get into this circular flow when, when you acknowledge, okay, and, and the big question is, is there a God? If there's a God and there's an active God, then miracles are perfectly reasonable, especially if we assume that God wants to have a relationship with us, that he wants to communicate with us. Mm -hmm. And that goes to the purpose of the miraculous. Um, I've, I've heard it said this way. Some people think of the miraculous signs as kind of a cosmic magic show. And, you know, the, the apostles are going ahead of Jesus, like the carnival barkers saying, come see the man that walks on water, heals the sick, raises the dead, you know. Um, calms the storm, you know, gets money from a fish, you know, things like that. And that's not what yeah, the fish just swallowed a coin. That's not too impressive. Well, and, and, and what we need, one, one side note here is sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, miracles are just the way people explained the inexplicable. Well, I mean, are there times it's possible that God worked through a process of the natural world that the ancients couldn't explain? Sure. Yeah. But that's not all of what happened, okay? Right. That 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 could go to you know, fish in I'm, all the examples I'm thinking of have to do with fish. Uh, you know, all the fish being caught at you know they don't catch anything all night and then they catch them all at once. Okay, so God woke up the fish, still got acting. But that is some things can be explained in God working through things. There are things that cannot be explained, um, like water separating. Right. Uh, like, uh, like people being raised from the dead, which, you know, that's, yeah. that's the most obvious one and creation itself. Right. So creating something from nothing is usually pretty impressive. Yeah, nothing. In fact, that's one of the, uh, that, um, we may get into this later, but that's one of the biggest arguments in favor of theism. Nothing comes from nothing for there to be something. There must have been something. Right. And then just, you know, and, and where, where does it come from? But the thing about the miracles is, the the Bible covers a lot of history, mm -hmm. but it covers it selectively. The Bible is about God working. And so the Bible is not claiming that miracles just happened all the time. And I mean, you, you walk down a street corner, oh, there's a prophet healing somebody, whatever, I'm gonna go about my life. 
there's a reason people flock to Jesus. This was new. This was different. This didn't happen. And the miracles in the Bible tend to cluster around revelatory events. See, God's leading the people out of Egypt, and he is building a covenant with them. There's a lot of signs around those events, okay? Um, God, there's a massive spiritual conflict in the northern kingdom during the reign of Ahab. God's doing a lot of things. The biggest revelation, Jesus in the church, that is the, that's the most concentrated dose of miraculous signs. Again, I keep coming back to that word signs. That's the most concentrated dose of miraculous signs in the entire Bible. I mean, this is about a, I mean, if you want to include Acts, you're looking at about a 30-year period, and you can't turn a page practically without hitting a miracle. And that, and by the way, Jesus talks about this in Mark 2. That's the healing of the lame man that they tear the hole in the roof, you know, that the homeowner and the insurance company love that. Um, and Jesus, he, he says, son, your sins are forgiven, and the Pharisees freak out. And we give the Pharisees a lot of grief, and I can understand that. Um, they deserve a little grief in this situation for not talking to Jesus, instead grumbling amongst themselves. They don't deserve grief for saying, wait a minute, hold on a second, that's blasphemy. If you're not God, that's blasphemy. And Jesus says, which is easier, to say to this man, take up your pallet and walk, or to say to him, your son, your sins are forgiven? So that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He turns to the man, and he says, son, pick up your pallet and walk, and he does. They're, the miraculous signs are just that. They're signs. This is God working. Pay attention. Mm -hmm. So, um, wondering, you know, kind of going into the, the idea of, of signs, um, why, why is it that, we, that, that God would do it in this way? Is there significance that we should read into, um, you know, God working through miracles rather than some other form of communication? Well, he, God works through a lot of forms of communication. Um, miraculous signs, though, is definitely an attention grabber. And it is, it's a lot of the signs that you see. The, the only way you're going to be able to avoid acknowledging something is going on is just by willing, willing, willful disbelief. Just saying, no, I'm, I'm ruling that out immediately. Okay, and by the way, interestingly enough, even skeptics during, even the opponents of Jesus during Jesus' life didn't take that approach. They didn't believe Jesus was who he claimed to be, but they didn't argue, and you actually see them say this several times. Okay, what are we going to do? Because we can't argue that a miracle didn't take place. Yeah. So we'll blame Satan for it instead. You know, real bright guys. Okay. But these, these, God is working through these to say, hey, now that I have your attention, listen. And these are very much events that get people's attention. And there are events that take care of people, too. You know, Jesus, a lot of his miracles, it says Jesus has compassion mm -hmm. on these. They, uh, I'm pretty sure he says that in the feeding of the 5,000. He has compassion on them. He wants to feed them. See? See, he wants to feed them, but he doesn't want to send them away because he doesn't want some to not come back. So let's take care of them. Let's feed them, and they can stay here and listen to me teach some more. I mean, you know, it's like a teacher bringing donuts to class. Hey, pay attention. You know, here's food. But, uh, let me ask a couple other points here. Uh, well, let me make one point. And let me ask you about another one. Um, just kind of going along with the historicity here. And if uh, I'm not sure, I don't think we have a week on just the historical nature of the Bible. But um, just to talk about it, um, remember the people that write these things down lose their livelihoods. and sometimes often lose their lives because of it. And so one of the generic arguments for belief in scripture as being true, but specifically in miracles as being true, is at the high end of things, these people died saying this is true. They died because of their faith. The other part of that, though, is all of these people um, who aren't powerful uh, but were there have every ability to, uh, during the first century, while they're still alive, to say, hey, 
wait a second, I was there, that's not true. Uh, th there could have been some reaction against it. And, and for the record, there was the people in power who tried to, to cover it up, to say that Jesus wasn't who he, says he, who he said he was. But Jeremy, you, you already made the good point. They even acknowledged, well, we can't, we can't say that the thousands of people over there didn't see what they saw. So uh, faith becomes sight at that point. Let me, let me just get into some, some weird things. And I, this is getting a little bit off topic, but we'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, two ideas here. Um, how do we think about modern Christians or different people that, that claim to perform miracles? And also uh, modern and ancient, even within the Bible, how do we think about it when the occult or the demonic is performing miracles, doing things that we would not uh, usually expect? Because there seems to be some pretty strong biblical evidence that it's not just God that has powerful uh, has power to do miracles. Well, it, I think the best answer to that goes back to the purpose of the miracles. Mm -hmm. The miracles have a purpose they're not just hey look at the cool stuff that that we can do um they are pointing to something deeper okay so when when you're considering these things it's the revelation it's the word of god that determines what we believe what we practice what we do um and so yeah and there's there's there are differing opinions on whether um, God allows the supernatural activity that today with the, with the demonic world that he allowed back during the first century. Um, I mean, you know, there's, there's clear demonic possession back during the first century. People argue over whether or not that ceased, um, that God said, okay, I let you work in the world so I could cast you out. Now you're done. And I'm putting you in chains again. And God, God can do that if he wants. I mean, you know, he's God. Um, but setting all of that aside, um, Paul says in Galatians that if he or an angel from heaven preaches a different gospel from the one Paul proclaimed to the Galatians, let them be accursed. So even if an angel from heaven comes down and is proclaiming something contrary to the word of God, we should not follow it because we have the word of God. So, and, and it's interesting, there's a, there's a certain, Jesus points out a certain logical contradiction. They accuse him of doing his miraculous signs by the power of Satan. And Jesus is like, why would Satan work against himself? That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Jesus makes a, a good point there that the signs will, the signs from God will be obvious and undeniable. Okay. Um, undeniable undeniable in the sense that you can't deny something happened okay um and and it's interesting you know um again they we go back to this idea of other explanations for for things um are there things that happen today that you can look at and say okay that could be a miracle or there could be other naturalistic explanations for what just happened don't see a lot of people walking on water today that's fair. Don't see a lot of people taking five loaves and two fish and turn and feeding five thousand people. Okay, I've I've seen some impressive potlucks in my time, but that takes the cake or the fish in this case. You don't you don't see <laughs> all of the faith healers out there? I have the power of God. Okay, raise the dead. Well, well, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't get that power. And, you know, Jesus had that power, but, but you know, uh, after Jesus, that power went away. Really? Tell that to Tabitha. Tell that to Eutychus, who is the classic, um, the classic object lesson on why not to fall asleep in church. See? The apostles raised the dead, too. So when a sign comes from God, there is a different quality to it that you see in in the bible in in the biblical record okay so um so i'm trying to think other different points that we need to hit on here uh pardon me if i'm skipping over things here but so what what are the uh, what's what are the explanations so um what can we say 
is is the reason why this happened. So I, I think if, if we talk to our friends that believe in science as the reason for this, they'll, they'll ask, okay, science isn't your reason. Give me an explanation. What can I depend on here? Well, you can depend on God. I mean, you know, again, God wrote the laws of nature. God can intervene in them. And, and by the way, when we, when we look at intervening in the laws of nature, we intervene in the laws of nature on a regular basis too. I mean, the law of gravity says if something falls off your shelf, it's going to fall until it hits the floor or until it hits something. We reach out and catch it. See, we're, we're stopping the law of gravity from doing gravitational things. Okay, what, now what God is doing is on a much different scale and of a much different type. I mean, we are interposing one natural law with another natural law. You know, we're, we're interposing, you know, um, matter can't pass through solid matter into the law of gravity when we catch something. So we're using natural law in that case. So that, that wouldn't be a miracle. But God, what God is saying is, look, I'm here. And that, that, again, that really is the purpose. One of the purposes of miracle is God is saying, I'm here. See, God created the natural world. God is a God of order. So there is an order to the natural world. And you can depend on God as a God of order and a God of, of well, the scientific method would not work if God had not been a God of order because there would be disorder. God created us with scientific curiosity. I mean, the scientific revolution was started by Christians who were look, seeking to understand the world that God gave us. So there's not really, a, a lot of people try to make it into a contradiction between miracles and science. It's not a contradiction. These aren't contradictory elements. They're different elements. Okay. So we have trust in a God of order and we have trust in a God who says, I am here and I am working. Yeah. It, to me, that's comforting yeah. that, um, that all, all of like, uh, well, it, first of all, the, the historical nature of the Isaac Newtons of the world, of the Isaac Watts who wrote the textbook on logic that was used at Yale for like 150 years, uh, that so many people uh, that are pillars of the scientific community, including the current head of the NIH, Francis Collins, who has spoken at the Christian Scholars Conference several times, these are people of faith that believe that uh, their scientific discovery is rooted in God himself. And because of that order, um, it is so much more special when God decides to intervene. Uh, I know we got two minutes left in our 30. Um, uh, Jeremy, you were talking about this earlier. Out of all of the evidence, you know, kind of our, our closing thought here, out of all of the evidence that's here, what's most convicting to you? What, what's the one thing that you go to uh, that uh, even when you're feeling doubts, like what, what stands to reason here? Well, I think for me, and, and part of this is just who I am and what I'm interested in. Um, the fact that this is, this is an issue of history. And, okay, look, without going into a great, without delving into a great deal of, of depth um, or detail, if we can't trust the historicity of the Gospels, we don't have any history of the ancient world. They are the best attested ancient classical works ever. I mean, there's, there's more copies and closer in time of the New Testament than anything else and it's there's a they read like real events we were talking earlier about why these miracles and not the miracles that are attributed to muhammad well the stories about muhammad weren't really written down or collected until like centuries half a millennium later the stories about Jesus, depending on where you put the gospels i tend to put matthew in the 30s um i know michael you may disagree with that, but no, I, I put everything before 70 AD. Okay. Well, okay. Even in the ancient world, even that is, is break is like a breaking news bulletin. When you consider the culture of the ancient world and the way things work back then. Um, but if Matthew was written in the late thirties, early forties, that's within a decade of the life of Jesus. 
I mean, there's people around that saw and heard and they could stand up and say, nah, uh, um, probably one of the oldest attestations about Jesus is, um, the, the, uh, the formula at the beginning of first Corinthians 15, mm -hmm. which, I mean, you can trace that back to Jerusalem in the early thirties. So in the early thirties in Jerusalem, the church is proclaiming that there are 500 people that Jesus appeared to raised after he was raised from the dead in Jerusalem, where it is purported to have happened. I mean, the historical evidence, and, and that's the key thing. We're not talking about all miracles. We're talking about these miracles. Take the biggest miracle, the resurrection of Jesus. We're not talking about everybody else. We're talking about what is the best explanation that fits these facts here. And the best explanation is Jesus was raised. It's, it fits what we know of historical record. And again, if we can't trust this, we can't really trust anything from, from the classical world. I mean, it's just, if you're going to apply the same rules, these almost have to be historical. Mm -hmm. And so it's true. It happened to circle back to that idea of it's history. It's true. It happened. This is real. And that's something you can ground on is this is reality. Yeah. Um, just to echo some of the things you said, um, you know, do you believe that the Peloponnesian Wars happened? If you believe that, you believe something with less evidence than any of the biblical narratives that we have. Um, I, we could spend a whole, a whole nother class talking about the, the resurrection of, of Jesus and it always baffles me when people think that, well, maybe he didn't actually die. Oh, no, these were trained killers. Yeah. This is what the people did. This was their job, to know when someone was dead or alive. And that technology has not changed over the past 2,000 years. Uh, you know, I guess now we have mirrors to see if they can fog up. So uh, let me, okay, so two, two final points, and uh, I know we're a little over time. Um, first, uh, having to do with the idea of, let's say you, you're talking with someone. Uh, that that is purporting this idea. Two kind of gentle things uh, that you could bring up just to kind of ease the conversation. One, I would say that, um, you know, to the extent that they they believe that science is the worldview that, that is dominating the world today, even though we don't disagree with it, I would point them to the East, that most of the world still believes in uh, in a theistic worldview, we might disagree with what God they believe in, but the dominant worldview is still one of believing that the supernatural, that the spiritual, is very real. And even our millennial, I guess we're kind of millennials. Uh, elder, I'm an elder millennial. Um, there's this rising rebellion against modernism called postmodernism. And yeah, there's a lot of problems with postmodernism, but one part of postmodernism is a rejection of the rigidity of saying that science is all that there is. Uh, and to me, that, that's kind of a gateway uh, for, for religion to come back in to, to point out, yes, there is a problem with viewing uh, that science is all that there is, but there's also a problem with, with then uh, concluding that there's nothing that is settled because of that. Um, and so th there, there's, there's a way for us to, gr to bring more people in, I think, because of, of saying that this new worldview of modernism is not going to bring us the truth that we're looking for. Uh, final quick thought, and I know I've, I've gone way too long. Um, when you're having conversations with people about miracles, try to set up early on in the argument, um, like if we can establish that God exists, can we then talk about, can we put miracles aside for a second? Because I think if I can convince you on God in other ways, perhaps that's where their real hangups are, is not in the science, but rather there's some other hangout about God, and that has led them to believe that miracles aren't real. Because as Jeremy, you outlined this well earlier, it's a circular argument. And so you might get lost there and not have a productive conversation with your friend or family member or coworker. Rather, ask them, what else is going on? What are your other reasons for not believing in God? And perhaps that can, once you establish those things, you can bring it along uh, to issues of miracles. 
So sorry, I went a little long there. Um, we are uh, we're through week three now. Uh, Jeremy, what's our what's our next topic that we're? I was I was afraid you were going to ask me that. Of course. Uh, I did not take the time to look it up beforehand. It is uh, but, 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 evolution explains life, so God isn't needed. So a little bit of a of an extension here, but we're going to focus specifically on evolution, uh, creation. Uh, can we talk a little bit about theistic evolution as well? Yeah, probably. Why, I will ask about it, whether you like it or not. Go right ahead. <laughs> All right. Looking forward to our class next Sunday morning. And uh, as always, uh, we're, we appreciate you being with us, and we'll see you then. See you next week.